Tony Warner is the founder and director of Black History Walks. They are guided tours which highlight the influences and contributions of people of African descent. All of these factors, in fact, taking part over the centuries. And more importantly, the focus on many parts of London. Well, Black History Walks opens up a hidden world of African heritage sites, institutions and architecture in and around the capital. It's the only kind of its, it's the only tour of its kind. And Mr. Warner has, been identif has identified an aspect of tourism that previously excluded African Britons. Well, earlier I spoke to him about his enterprising idea. The director of Black History Walks, a guided tour organisation which is promoting three and a half thousand years of often neglected African history in the capital. A very good morning to you. Thank you. I mean, when you actually look at the Black Presence in London, a lot of people assume what well, it started in the late 1940s, mm -hmm. early 50s, yeah. with the first wave of West Indian immigration. But it actually goes back much further. We can go back 2,000 years to when the Romans came here because there were African people who came here with the Roman Empire. Um, the Roman Empire included parts of North Africa, Libya, Morocco, Tunisia, and at that period of time, there was no such thing as color prejudice as such. So as a black person, African person, you could be at every level of Roman society. And in fact, there was an African Roman Emperor called Septimus Severus, who came here, actually lived in England, and he ruled the Roman Empire from York. He actually <laughs> was buried in York in 311 AD. So you had an African Roman Emperor who was here 2,000 years ago. You had African troops from North Africa who were actually based in uh, near Hadrian's Wall. And they left graffiti there saying, we're from Ethiopia and this place is called the Miserable we want to go home. Um, Presumably some of that graffiti still survives. It's still there. I mean, it's, it's documented fact. And there's a recent discovery of a, a woman called the Ivory Bangle Lady. Ivory Bangle Lady, also in York. And she was an aristocratic woman um, who was buried with a, a lot of um, details about her life. And from analyzing her skeleton remains and DNA, they proved that she was from North Africa as well. So the African presence, black presence here, goes back at least 2,000 years that we can easily prove. Right, but the fact was is that they benefited under the Roman Empire because it was, a, it was run pretty much like a meritocracy. So in other words, if you were a fantastic soldier, yeah. you happened to be a very good politician as well, yeah. then the sky really was the limit. You could say that, absolutely, because there was a particular Roman general called Lucius Quietus, who was also from North Africa, was one of the best generals they ever had. So, yeah, it's quite interesting that you have this kind of meritocracy um, 2,000 years ago, which kind of changed, of course, in more recent times. Yeah, and that's the point about the sense of change because, for example, if we spool forward mm -hmm. to Elizabethan Britain, we had Elizabeth I actually complaining there were too many black people that's and that they should right. be sent back home. Yeah. <laughs> it's a pretty familiar message <laughs> really, to a 21st century audience. Absolutely. I mean, she said that in 1596, so of course it means there were African people here in 1596. And there's a document called the Westminster Tournament Scroll, which is at uh, the Kew Archives, and it shows a, a black man, African man, called John Blank. He's playing a trumpet, and this black man called John Blank was part of the royal entourage. He was working for King Henry the Seventh and King Henry the Eighth. He was a paid musician because the initial contact between Europe and Africa was one of trade and exchange. So the initial uh, uh, presence here was one of ambassadors, um, interpreters, tradespeople, business people who were here as equals. So, and you can actually see that in the, in the depictions of them. And then later on, of course, in the 1600s, 1700s, that's when you have the rise of slavery and then you have the denigration of black people when it comes to imagery and, and history. Yeah, and I mean, a lot of money was made not just out of selling black people, but also taking commodities from their homeland, trading it. Well, one of the interesting things that... Empires <laughs> built on it, in fact. One of the parts of our culture is that if you get married to a, a, a person, you're supposed to offer them a ring. And what is that ring made for most of the time? It's made from gold. But there's no gold in England. So where is all this gold coming from? There's a place called Ghana, which used to be called the Gold Coast, the gold Coast. because we're getting all, all of our gold from there. So there's one aspect of black history, which, which is literally in your fist or in your finger. But of course, if you want to really impress your wife or girlfriend, you put some diamonds in that gold ring. There's no diamonds in England or South France. South Africa. So, uh, absolutely. South Africa, Sierra Leone, Congo. So we're getting a lot of our raw material from Africa, which then becomes part of our culture here. And you see these things every day. You go past a jeweler shop, it's full of gold and diamonds, but where's this stuff coming from? And there's also the terminology as well, because we were talking off camera about the guinea. Yeah. Now, it's, it's a much used term, particularly at the horse tracks. But yeah. again, guinea, the reference to Africa. Yeah, there were, in 1663 a new coin was commissioned and it was called the Guinea. It was called the Guinea because the goal to make that, that particular coin came from the Guinea coast of Africa. That's what they called it the Guinea. So it's, it's like rather than you have a pound in your pocket, you call it Niger the Nigeria. That's how integral Africa was or is to British economy that they actually named this unit of currency the Guinea. Um, and you still find that term being used even now. If you go to horse race and Ascot, the jackpot is always in Guineas. If you look at some of the um, sailing races, their, their jackpot is also measured in the Guineas, which goes back 
back to this African currency that we used here in England. And the, at one time, the Bank of England was full of African gold because, like I said, there's no gold here. So where's all this gold coming from? But it's interesting you've mentioned the Bank of England because there was a governor who owned plantations. He, he, he owned plantations and he owned slave trading vessels. There were several governors who did that. There was a whole bunch of them. But this guy was called Sir Humphrey Morris and he actually owned for something like six slave ships. So he was directly profiting from uh, the slave, slave industry. But also you found a lot of the West Indian planters who had plantations in the Caribbean would invest their money in the Bank of England. And that money was then be used to kind of, you know, generate a business here. So there's a direct connection between some of the wealth and resources we have here and where that wealth came from in the Caribbean with regard to slavery. And labor. the concentration of a lot of that wealth in the city of London, the big stockbroker houses, etc. Uh, in fact, Lloyd's of London began life as a small coffee house on Lombard Street, small coffee house, which is still, the place is still there, there's a plaque there right now. Um, but they, their first hundred users so were involved in insuring slave ships. So if the ships left Africa to the Caribbean, then Lloyds would insure the cargo as it was, and that's how they made their money. And when you think about Lloyds now, it's a massive multi-billion dollar corporation, but the roots of their wealth are in slavery. So th th that's the economic legacy of black people, but there's also an architectural legacy as well. Yeah, I mean, in London, on the embankment, there's something called, that we call Cleopatra's Needle. Okay. Now, London is roughly 2,000 years old, when the Romans came in 2,000 years ago. This, this Cleopatra's Needle was brought here from Africa by the British, um, and this obelisk, Cleopatra's Needle, is 3,500 years old. So the obelisk that was taken from Africa is 3,500 years old, which, which proves that London is a it was built 1,500 years before London even existed. It was built in Africa by African people. Um, it weighs 180 tons, it's 60 foot tall, and it was produced by an African civilization using their art and their culture and their technology. So if you want to look at the full context of black history, you have to look, go back thousands of years, and the, the proof is on the, of the pudding is right down the embankment.